Introduction to the Coronavirus Coronavirus, or COVID-19, is a respiratory illness that spread from person to person via respiratory droplets. Clinical personnel working in skilled nursing facilities or assisted living facilities should understand basic COVID-19 guidelines to better protect their own safety and the safety of their patients. Signs and Symptoms Reported illnesses range from mild symptoms to severe illness. Symptoms appear 2 to 14 days after exposure and commonly include fever, cough, and shortness of breath, while other symptoms may include nasal congestion, runny nose, sore throat, and diarrhea. Symptoms are usually mild, with some individuals being asymptomatic. Up to 80% of the infected community population recover without the need to seek medical care. Older adults, especially over 80 years of age, and those with comorbid conditions, are at an increased risk for more severe illness, typically in the second week. Fortunately, it appears infected young children generally present with mild symptoms compared to adults and geriatric individuals. Transmission. COVID-19 is spread from person to person by respiratory droplets, typically by a cough or sneeze, between close contact individuals, usually within six feet. The most contagious period is believed to be when people are at their sickest. COVID-19 is not believed to be spread via airborne transmissions, such as seen with tuberculosis or measles. Reducing transmission. Strategies to reduce transmission include appropriate hand washing for at least 20 seconds, including before and after contact with residents, after contact with contaminated surfaces or equipment, after removing personal protective equipment, PPE, and before eating. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Ensure alcohol-based hand rub is inside and outside of every resident's room. Make sure sinks are well stocked with soap and paper towels for hand washing. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue, then throw the tissue in the trash. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and services using EPA registered hospital grade disinfectant. Post signs outside of the resident room that clearly describe the type of precautions needed. Place PPE, including face masks, eye protection, gowns, and gloves available in the outside of the resident room. Position a trash can near the exit inside any resident room to make it easy for employees to discard PPE. Minimize interactions with suspected COVID-19 patients. Restrict residents with fever or acute respiratory symptoms to their room. If they must leave, have them wear a face mask. And most importantly, stay home when you are sick. Infection Control Healthcare workers are at risk of coming into contact with germs that can cause disease by spreading from person to person. There are several practices used by healthcare professionals to stop this spread. Standard and transmission-based isolation precautions guidelines are based upon the latest recommendations from the CDC. Standard precautions. Standard precautions are used to prevent the spread of bloodborne germs. They're used when providing care to all individuals, whether or not they appear infectious or symptomatic. Standard precautions include wearing gloves and other personal protective equipment as necessary when in contact with potentially infectious materials, using sharps disposal units, never recapping needles. Hand washing is the number one way to prevent the spread of infections. Transmission-based precautions and isolation categories. Transmission-based precautions are used in addition to standard precautions when caring for patients who have or may have a contagious disease. Within this group, there's three types of isolation categories, including 1. Airborne isolation is used when a patient is infected with a disease caused by small airborne droplets, such as TB. These patients are typically held in a specialized negative air pressurized room, and staff are required to use a respirator. 2. Droplet isolation is used when a patient has a known or suspected infection 
with germs that are transmitted by larger droplets, such as meningitis, COVID-19, pertussis, influenza, and mumps. A mask is required if working within six feet of these patients. 3. Contact isolation is used when a patient has an infection or is colonized with germs that can be transmitted from direct contact with the patient or their environment. Examples include VRE, MRSA, C. difficile, RSV, hepatitis A, scabies, or lice. Wear gloves and gown for each entry into the room. Personal Protective Equipment, PPE. PPE is specialized clothing or equipment, such as gloves, gowns, masks, eye protection, that are worn by an employee for protection against an infectious hazard. Key points regarding PPE include, employees should wear gloves when coming into contact with potentially infectious materials. Masks should be worn whenever splashing, spraying, or splattering droplets of blood or other potential infectious material occurs. Disposable contaminated items must be disposed in a proper biohazard waste bin. Bloodborne Pathogen, BBP, Exposure Control Plan The purpose of the Bloodborne Pathogen Exposure Control Plan is to reduce or eliminate occupational exposures to clinical staff. The risk of this exposure is reduced or eliminated by using Standard Precautions Engineering controls, such as sharps units, needleless systems, and self-sheathing needles. Personal protective equipment. Cleaning all work surfaces after contamination or potential contamination using an appropriate disinfectant. Minimize splashing, spraying, splattering, and generation of droplets of blood or potential infectious material when performing procedures. Place all specimens of blood or other potential infectious material in a properly labeled container. Discard all contaminated sharps immediately in containers that are closable, puncture-resistant, leak-proof, and appropriately labeled. Do not eat, drink, or apply cosmetics, lip balm, or handle contact lenses in areas where there is a likelihood of BBP exposure. Blood and Body Fluid Exposures Blood and body fluid exposure is defined as an injury with a contaminated sharp object, such as a needle stick, or spills or splashes of blood or other potential infectious material onto a mucous membrane or non-intact skin that results from the performance of an employee's duties. The two important components to prevent infections following a blood and body fluid exposure are 1. Hepatitis B immunization and 2. Post-exposure management. If you have a blood and body fluid exposure, the most important steps include immediately and thoroughly wash the contaminated area or flush mucous membranes with water. Notify your on-site nursing supervisor at your current healthcare facility. Fill out an employee incident report at your healthcare facility. Work with your facility to find an occupation or urgent care clinic nearest to your current location.